Okay, so today um, we want to really get into the uh, guts of BLAST. This week's lab has you starting to read the uh, BLAST tutorial information from NCBI, particularly on how to use BLAST. Later you'll read the uh, documentation on BLAST statistics, and I'll uh, have some more, and we have more material on the web. In fact, today what I'm going to be talking, one of, one of the things I'm going to be talking about <coughs> is some material that's linked to the, um, this week's lab. It's, it's uh, lecture notes on BLAST that are available from uh, the lab that we developed here. Uh, some of these are a little bit dated, but they're still, I think, good notes for you to look at. How many people used BLAST before this week's lab? Uh, a handful of people. Okay. So BLAST... Um, I should have brought in this quote, but in, in the, one of the books that I suggested you might want to look at, the one that's called Developing Computer Skills for Bioinformatics, uh, she has in there a statement that sort of suggests that for many biologists, BLAST is bioinformatics, uh, that BLAST at least is the uh, way that many biologists were first introduced to bioinformatics and to the value of bioinformatics. BLAST is a suite of programs that allows very rapid uh, uh, lookup uh, of similar sequences, DNA uh, and protein sequences originally, now more tailored to, DNA, to, to protein sequences, less so to DNA, but uh, allows very rapid lookup uh, and sequence similarity, uh, essentially, I'll be more precise about that in a minute. Between a query sequence and a database of many sequences. So, for example, SwissProt is one of, I think, what you're using in your, your lab uh, this week. So database of, of amino acid sequences. Now, uh, why, first of all, why BLAST? Why something different than what we presently do or have learned so far in this class? Why don't you just, you know, we learned about alignment, global alignment, local alignment, end gap free alignment, and there are various other hybrid types of alignments and we've argued that, uh, demonstrated, that for two sequences at a time, even fairly long sequences, uh, these methods based on dynamic programming are efficient. The methods based on pure enumeration wouldn't be efficient. We argued that very early on. But methods based on dynamic programming, all the ones we've seen so far, run in time or number of operations as proportional to the product of the two sequence lengths. And even when you're talking about sequences of lengths 1,000 or so, that's a, only a million, and that's relatively simple for a computer to do. A million, 12 million operations, 20 million operations. I mean, we have computers today which I think do billions of operations per second. So uh, why do you need to do anything different than that? So you have your query and you have your huge database. So here, here's what I'll represent as the query. And here is the database of sequences. But all it is is just one sequence after another. Why don't you just use your dynamic programming method, whatever it is you think is useful, let's say local alignment, and you do uh, local alignment between your query sequence and the first sequence in, in, this, in the database, and then you do it with the next one, the next one, and so on. And you uh, essentially would want to report which of the sequences in here had the best or highest scoring alignment to the query sequence. Probably you'd want to take some statistics as you do all these. You'd want to learn what the average value was, what the distribution is. You want to make sure that uh, the ones that you report are sufficiently different you know, many, several standard deviations perhaps above the average, whatever. But why don't you, you just look at each one in turn and do the alignment and then report in one way or the other 
the ones that look really good? What's the answer? This is really a trick question, actually. I should give you a hint. Nobody, nobody brave enough to uh, give an answer? Why you don't do this? Well, actually, the, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, the answer was, you did, I mean, the, the, the response here was you'd have to copy all of these to your local computer where you did these computations. But, you know, your, the, the computer that holds these things might also have the dynamic programming computation available. Or, you know, you get, you get all these sequences on a little DVD and not a big deal to have them all. Um, so the answer, okay, the question was why don't they do this? And the... First answer is well they do, actually. But it depends on who they are, and you've you've used one. You've used Time Logic. The Time Logic machine does do this. It does Swiss Waterman uh, local alignment between the query and everybody in the database, one after another. But that's a, a very expensive machine, and it's fine when it's doing, uh, you know, one or two users who are who are doing this or even you know, a whole class, as long as not everybody's doing it at once. And it's okay if it takes a minute, let's say, which is, I think that's probably what people are experiencing when you're using um, time logic or something on that order. Okay, so, uh, and time logic sells their machines to companies that's, I don't know how much they cost, but it's a lot more than your typical um, molecular biology lab on campus is willing to pay. I don't think we have a single one on campus. So they're, so they're sold to big pharmaceutical companies and so on. Very expensive. So with, with enough money, if, you're, uh, if you own that machine and you, you're the only user or only a few users, you really can do this. Okay? But if you're NCBI or even UC Davis and you have tons of people who want to look at the database, uh, it's just, and, and you, you have to uh, buy a machine that's some reasonable cost. Uh, it's just not practical to use local alignment on every query and every sequence in the database. So despite the fact that dynamic programming allowed us to do uh, two sequence alignment very efficiently, or very practically, when you multiply by the number of sequences here and you multiply by the number of queries that you're going to hit it with, uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands a day, then uh, it's not yet practical to do dynamic programming on each pair of sequences. So, and I, I emphasize yet because developments like machines like the Time Logic machine, and there's some competitors to that, by the way. <coughs> Uh, show you that it's, you know, if it's feasible but expensive today, it's going to be feasible and cheap within some uh, reasonable time period, I guess. But at any rate, not yet feasible to do, usually you want to do local alignment, Smith-Waterman. Uh, between every query and database sequence pair. I, I hope they can read this on the uh, monitor. <coughs> and by that I mean every pair, a query string, and there are many of them, throughout the day or any given moment. And, uh, if you look at what's at the traffic at NCBI, for example, many queries that are coming in and a very large database. And if you were to do local alignment between each one of these using Smith-Waterman, uh, it would not be feasible. Okay? So here we again have this, this feasibility constraint. 
going back to the very first lecture where I said that there are things we would like to do. We would like to do local alignment, but we're not able to for some practical reasons and therefore have to come up with some kind of compromise. And you as users or as, as people who uh, come to work in this field uh, have to evaluate whether the compromises uh, were effective, whether they, they threw away the objective of finding good matches that were biologically meaningful. So as I show you what, what BLAST actually does, uh, you have to try to think about it or experiment it with, with it later uh, on various things that you find where BLAST will report something, but you should then look at it with Smith-Waterman or some other tool uh, and see if, if it still looks like it, the right thing. And to the extent that you can do this, you should try to find things that BLAST didn't tell you about and see whether Smith-Waterman uh, would have found those as being interesting matches. There are There is sort of a, a recurrent uh, research paper that gets published every six months or a talk in every other conference I go to where people compare pure dynamic programming, Smith-Waterman local alignment, to things like BLAST, and there are many other uh, uh, alternatives, to see whether uh, biologically they're picking up the same, uh, the same kinds of relationships or whether one is more effective than the other. And it, these papers continually report that local alignment, Smith-Waterman, uh, is more sensitive. It picks up uh, biological relationships that seem to be more informative than what BLAST does. BLAST is tremendously valuable because it, is, uh, it makes this kind of activity practical, but the objective, the goal of making this as good as local alignment uh, seems not to be there yet. I mean, I have no opinion one way or the other, but uh, this is the, uh, the conclusion of people who look at this every six months or so. I mean, it seems like you know, yet another person is doing it, and they come out with the same conclusion as the, as the, previous, the previous ones. Okay, so how does BLAST overcome this feasibility problem? Remember what it really would like to do. It would like to do local alignment, Smith-Waterman local alignment, between the query sequence and everything in the database. So that, that's really the, the, the meta goal uh, is really to find the same uh, good matches, that is, sequences in the database um, with high local alignment score. find the same good matches as Smith-Waterman would. But uh, do it very, very fast. Of course, whenever you're talking about Smith-Waterman, you, you have to specify all the parameters in order to make it really truly biologically effective. What's the, um, uh, what mismatch penalties are you using? What's the substitution matrix you're going to use? What values for matches and so on? And if there are gaps in there, uh, if you allow spaces and gaps in the alignment, what are the parameters for spaces and gaps and all of those things? So when people do these experiments to show the effectiveness of Smith-Waterman or against BLAST, they're, they're always fine-tuning those things. And that's why, to some extent, to some extent there's, a, uh, there's still an opportunity for the next paper because somebody can try uh, twiddling the parameters slightly differently uh, to see if they get a different conclusion. All right. So this is the meta goal. And how we do this is how BLAST does this um, 
Uh, well, actually, I'm, what I'm going to do is explain BLAST1 first. So BLAST1 was introduced about 1990. And it was the uh, BLAST system that was uh, available th uh, at NCBI until about 1997. And in 1997, uh, a, a new version called BLAST2, uh, <laughs> creative naming, or gapped BLAST is another uh, way people refer to it, was introduced. And that's the one that's the default today. If you want to use the old BLAST uh, on the NCBI site, you have to ask for it, ask for it explicitly. Uh, but still, it's useful to talk about BLAST1 first and then uh, BLAST2. Okay. So the basic idea, the basic idea is this. If we have a, uh, here's a database, here, database sequence, and here's a query sequence, okay, and it's trying to do local alignment. So here's a, here are a pair of sequences that have high global alignment value, but it's local alignment, so they're maybe somewhere contained in the two sequences. And if we have the normal Smith-Waterman Smith view of things, these are not identical. And in fact, there may be some spaces in the uh, alignment and so on, spaces and mutations. So things are not identical. However, and here's the idea, Generally, there will be some subinterval where things are actually identical. A small but not insignificant subinterval of complete identical matching. Okay, that's uh, the idea is generally in a good local alignment, so there will be a small subinterval of complete identical matching. Okay, let me just give you sort of an example. Um, AACT, ACTA, TCA. Okay, suppose this is contained in, in a database sequence and uh, in a query sequence you have a good local match to that. What that might be was, let's say, AA, TT, um, AGT, TT, uh, CA. Let me extend this a little bit because we got... Okay, so this whole thing might be the good local match, okay? But it's not identical. What's, where, where are the portions that are not identical? Um, well, let, let me go the other way. What are the portions that are identical? You have the double A matching. Identical and, I mean, in the exact same positions. Okay. So then you have TA, TA, and then you have um, this G mismatched, and then you have, well, actually, that's not, Identical, and then you have CAA, and that's identical. I'm skipping over uh, identical, just single characters, okay? So if you were to line up these two uh, sequences, uh, I didn't have any gaps in here, unfortunately, but anyway, you would see, well, there's a little bit, there's a little run of identities here, just two of them. That's not that unusual. Two here, and here there are three, Okay. So that's just to illustrate what I mean by this. Uh, the basic idea behind BLAST and other methods that are similar to it 
is that if you're going to have a two intervals here, two substrings, which have a, a high local alignment score, uh, despite the fact that these are not identical, you probably will have some small subintervals in there where you have a completely identical matching, as you have here. These guys and these guys and so on. All right? And if you turn that around, and the converse of that is that if I'm looking at two strings and they don't have any subintervals of complete identity that are long enough to be interesting, then probably or generally there is no good local alignment. So let me write down the converse. Converse, if two strings do not have any subintervals of sufficient length, and I'll be more precise about that in a minute, which are identical, then generally, or probably, whichever word you want to use, um, the two strings, the, 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 the local alignment value of the two strings is not high, will not be high. The local alignment value of the strings, the two strings, will be low. And so in the database retrieval context, you wouldn't be interested in those two strings. In, if you have your query string and a particular string in the database where there is no good local alignment between those two strings, you wouldn't want to report the database string as being something interesting and related to the query string. Okay? This is uh, a shortcut to trying to determine whether there's going to be a good local alignment between the two strings or not. If they don't have intervals of uh, sufficiently long intervals that are identical, then they probably will not have any subintervals of good local alignment. And therefore, probably you're not going to be interested in that. Okay, now I'm emphasizing the words probably and generally because you can definitely construct counterexamples and you can actually find counterexamples in real databases. Two sequences that are biologically related, two sequences that do have some high local alignment some good high scoring local alignment, but that local alignment does not contain actual intervals of identity. Maybe with you in a minute. Um, intervals of actual identity that are sufficiently long to trigger these mechanisms. Yeah? So, generally, how, how long should be the subintervals? Okay, the question is how long should the subintervals be, and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, but, but you know the answer. Okay. The question is, how long should these subintervals be? In the in the basic basic case, where all we're talking about are identities and and mismatches. Later, we're going to have scoring matrices. But what did we do all last week? What did we do all the last few lectures? You know, we're basically talking about uh, how long matches uh, can be while still looking like they came from something random versus matches that are long enough to make you think this was some non-random phenomenon. So, of course, what you'll want here for sufficiently long is something that's, that's going to distinguish uh, from th an event that could happen just by random. So what's the answer? Hmm?
Well, I mean, we learned something anyway about the, uh, uh, the probabilities of long matches within a, a database. Anyway, I'll connect all this to the, to the statistics and the probability stuff probably next lecture. But since you asked the question, I'm just telling you where we're going to get the answer from is by looking back at what we learned about the expectations and the probabilities of random matches. Okay, so everybody understand? Okay, so let me uh, give you a high-level view, therefore, of, of what BLAST does. Um, and then I'll ask whether you really understand why it would be more efficient than, um, than actually doing this dynamic programming local alignment between every pair. Now, what I'm, what I'm actually telling you, what I'm actually enumerating now is, um, well, certainly a fiction compared to what BLAST really does. BLAST is a huge program with all kinds of bells and whistles and, and engineering, but I'm, I'm emphasizing the main ideas. But moreover, at least right now, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm telling you what it would do for DNA, where it uses exact matching. When we get to, uh, we're talking about how, what it does in protein, then we have to introduce uh, the use of scoring matrices. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the actual example I'm going to use here has amino acid sequences, uh, but never mind. So this is sort of, this is a you know, very, very simplified, simplified uh, view of BLAST1. All right, so suppose we have uh, this sequence, KHL, Q, S. L, V, A, R. It goes on and on and on. This is our query. The first thing that BLAST does is it finds K-MERS. Okay? K-MERS, which means all of the substrings of length K. Well, these are substrings. of length k. So one of those substrings is khl. Another substring is hlq. Another substring is lqs, and so on. Now, in this little example, I said k equals 3. Um, if we were talking about DNA, I think... Um, for DNA in the original BLAST, K is around 11, 10 or 11, something on that order. Okay. I don't really know what it is today, but it's something like that. And for protein, it may be something... Well, actually, this is a good question. Knowing what we're trying to do, we're going to try to find uh, intervals in the sequences in the databases that have exact identity to some k -mer. If we're talking about protein, which has a 20-letter alphabet, versus DNA, which is a four-letter alphabet, and we're trying to distinguish matches that might have some biological significance from things that are just random events, which K is larger when, K, when we're talking about protein or when we're talking about DNA? When, when should K be larger, when, when we're dealing with protein or when we're dealing with DNA? I've heard both now. DNA, protein, how many people said RNA? Uh, <laughs> English. Um, how many people say protein should be the long one, the larger one? How many people say DNA? 
It's, quite, it's very interesting. You guys are all the statisticians, right? So the statisticians all said protein, and the biologists all said DNA. Okay. <laughs> so it must be a difference in thinking. Why, why did you think protein should be longer? Okay, why did you think DNA should be longer? DNA motifs are longer, promoter regions, UTRs, and stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm interpreting what you said as because. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, D- okay, DNA has four letters, protein has 20, but... That's to be specific for, for uh, proteins as well, because proteins are... Translated uh, products where in the DNA you can have if you match one such things, you have ex- introns and exons, you don't know what's there, and if it's a, especially if it's a gene. Yeah, okay, bi- you're thinking biologically, but uh, I guess I just means I mean in terms of um, random events versus non random. Yeah. I guess um, if you have four letters only, there's no chance of um, blood repeating or it's not a string for I mean, you're going for like protein and um, Right. Right, right, right. Okay, so it turned out that all the statisticians who should have gotten it right got it wrong. All the, I don't mean to make you feel bad, but you know. uh, because remember, what was the probability of matching for length m is p to the m, and p for DNA is a quarter. And P for uh, amino acids is 1 over 20. So the probability of matching, or 1 over 20, 1, 1 over 20 of the M, the probability of matching, let's say for length 3, is much higher with DNA than it is with protein. So you'll find matches, let's say if, if we used only K of 3, you're going to find matches in DNA that you know, may be there uh, only by random, only by chance, because the probability of that match is reasonably high. This is for any given position. We also have to ask, what's the probability over all of the positions, which is something we studied last time, too. But the point is still the same. If your P is higher, 1 quarter versus 1 twentieth, you're going to find short matches with higher probability than with this P, Okay. Conversely, if you're dealing with a, ri- a richer alphabet, uh, to find an exact match of length 3 in um, amino acids is just a, a rarer event than uh, a match with uh, only four letters. Okay? And again, you kind of saw this, well, uh, maybe you didn't, but back, in, back when we were looking for Elvis uh, in Swiss Pro, we found Elvis. And um, I think we found Liv's. But you never found them together. And the point is, uh, when you, as you go to, to longer and longer strings that you're looking for, the probability of finding it falls off very quickly. Um, so Elvis, E L V I S, it was like five and you found it, but when you got up to uh, eight or nine, it was, it was just not there. In DNA, you almost certainly would find random matches of length nine. Uh, just make up any you want, and you'll find it in, in the DNA databases. Okay, so anyway, that was uh, a digression, but it's the kind of thing I want everybody really to come away from being able to do. Y- if you don't, you won't remember the formulas we sh- I show you here, at least not past the midterm or the final. Um, but you should remember sort of intuitively which direction things go and, and uh, sort of the seat of the pants kind of thinking about what these things mean and, and, uh, and so on. All right, so back to the mechanics of BLAST. You form k of length k. I think in protein it is length 3 or 4, what, what BLAST1 used to use. And in DNA it's like 10, 11, 12, something like that. Okay, so 3 for amino acids, uh, 11 for DNA, but... 
Don't quote me in any way. Uh, now everybody uses BLAST two, which is a slightly different story, but we'll get to that in a minute. All right, but you have all of these k-mers. Now let's suppose all we're really interested in doing now is finding those uh, sequences in the database that contain uh, one of these k-mers. Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to. Uh, Elaborate on that, make that a little bit more interesting in a minute. But um, so, step one: find the k-mers, which are substrings of length k, in the query string. Is this fast or slow, by the way, compared to doing all that dynamic programming stuff? This is really trivial. I mean, you just have to have a moving window. And, you, you know, we'll write this program in Perl to just pick up each one of these k-mers. And the number of operations there is proportional to the length of this thing, not proportional to the product of two strings, lengths of two strings, not proportional to the product of the length of this string and all the strings in the database. Those, that would be what's implied by using dynamic programming. But just picking up all these um, k-mers is, is, really, uh, is really trivial. Um, step two is you want to quickly look up or quickly find those um, sequences. in the database that contain at least one of the uh, k-mers. found in step one. All right, how do you do this? What's a quick way of doing this one? Again, our, our goal is to be vastly faster than what dynamic programming would do. Dynamic programming has a number of operations that's proportional to the product of the two lengths. Total size of the database times the length of the string. Uh, that, that multiplicative... Um, the fact that it's a product is what makes the number of operations and therefore the time increase. If we can do something which is much faster than the product, then we're going we're gonna to win. Anybody have any ideas? I might not have, well, the computer scientists might. The rest of you, I probably didn't give enough background. How many are, people are CS majors here? I know there's some. They didn't come today. Okay. Um, all right. Well, here's here's a. Let's imagine again. This is the database, just as one huge huge um, uh, string. You just concatenated them all together, and suppose I I again. I take here a, a kmer. From starting from the first position. I want to know, is this kmer somewhere in this list? Anybody seen something recently on how you could do that quickly? Actually, maybe I didn't say it was quickly, but last time I told you about hashes in Perl. And one thing I didn't tell you is that hashes are very, very efficient. You can do that lookup very, very quickly. Uh, and I didn't really tell you how or why. But imagine, therefore, that we have this step 1.5 where we hash, we put each uh, of these found k-mers in a hash. That's called hashing this list. Uh, now, what does that really mean? It would mean in Perl, anyway, you would have some statement like 
hash, this would be the name of my, of my hash, KHL. Okay, that's the, that's the key, okay, that's being used now, is assigned something that tells you that it's really there. So let's say that's, we assign it the value 1, okay? So this hash under this key has a value 1. In Perl, there's also a, uh, a command, a function, which when you take a hash with a key that has no value, you haven't had an assigned value to that key, you can test that. It's called undefined or exists. I think well, I always use undefined. So if the hash with a particular key is undefined, it comes back and says, yes, it's undefined. Otherwise, it tells you, yes, actually, there is a value. So su suppose I have a Perl code which takes each one of these Kmers and puts it into a hash by such a statement. Um, then we've hashed all of these values. Then when I come along here, I grab a Kmer. I'm going to grab them one at a time as I go across here. I grab a Kmer, and I would then... Um, I have something in Perl that would say, if defined, so let's, let's say this thing went into a variable called Kmer. If defined Kmer, well, it says we've seen this Kmer in the hash list. Oops, sorry. If defined hash of Kmer. Okay? If that Kmer, whatever it happens to be, that's being held in this variable right now, has previously been put in the hash, then this is evaluated to true, and we get to do what's in this block. And if it's false, then we know that this Kmer, whatever it happens to be, is not in the hash. Let's just make up something in this first position. Uh, Q, Q, Q. Okay? That threemer is not here anywhere. Of course, this is supposed to be longer, but anyway, it's not in the little piece that I've shown you. And so this would come out as false. Um, hash of QQQ is not defined, has never been defined. So this is false, so we would not uh, do anything in here. Okay, so you just come along and look at these little kmers, and at some point you get QSL. Okay? And now when you your program says if defined and the value of the Kmer is QSL, yes, it is defined, which means that QSL, we found a, a threemer in this query sequence, which actually is in this list. And that corresponds to the, to the <laughs> intuition that used to be here, which is that you probably are only interested in sequences that have some run of absolute identities to something in the query sequence. Then you can, uh, what BLAST does when, they, when it finds this is step three. So if defined, you do step three, and you start looking to the left and to the right. These might actually be identities, too, because the run of identities can be longer than the Kmer that you, you're working on. The Kmer is the seed. The Kmer is what says, this might be an interesting relationship. Okay? 
And so you start looking out for here and here. Now, we also need to know where was this QSL. All right? So actually, when I do my hash, it's best not just to say one here, but to say where that was. So this is position one, two, three, four. And if this, if this, uh, uh, little camer actually appears more than once in here, we're going to have to record that too, and I'll tell you later how Perl does that. But just imagine now that this camer, this three mer, only appears once in our query sequence, and we know where it is because we've hashed that information. So when I find that, yes, QSL is here over in the database sequence, and I know where it was in the, in the query sequence, I can start looking to either side here and I see, oh, yeah, there's a V and a V there, okay? And uh, then you may find some disagreement, but you have some rules, A, Q, let's say. So this is an R, but this is a Q. And BLAST has some rules about how far it should look to the left and right if it starts running into some mismatches. As long as it's finding matches, it's just going to keep looking. If it starts finding some mismatches, then it, uh, it may not stop at the first one. It may tolerate one or two and keep going. It depends on what the overall score is. Okay? So base, all I'm going to say is sort of generally uh, look left and right to extend the seed. The seed is the camer. allowing some mismatches but the sum is is really you know part of the details it's why is what they engineered into blast with a lot of thought and experimentation um, and and if the resulting overall match Uh, overall aligned sequences has a high enough score. And what's a high score? That also depends. That's a particular detail that's built into BLAST. And you can learn what all these actually are uh, by reading the BLAST documentation, but I don't think it's that meaningful uh, to us right now. But if it has a high enough score, then um, uh, then you would uh, put this uh, sequence here on some kind of list that's going to be reported. And these peri these these sections of of good-looking matches between the query and the database, this thing is called a high-scoring pair, HSP. So BLAST accumulates sequences from the database that have a high, um, that have a good HSP, high-scoring pair, and anyway, HSP with the query sequence. Okay, now. I said this is very simplified, even for BLAST1. So let me just tell you two important uh, extensions of this. One is that uh, as we're going left and right here, as we move left and right, the evaluation of the goodness of this match is not just based on identities and mismatches, but in, in although it is in the case of DNA. In the case of protein, you use the substitution matrices to evaluate the goodness of, of this overall match. That's one important difference. And the other important difference, I'll get back to this next time, is that they don't just use a list of the, um, the camers, but they also form camers 
that are similar to the actual k-mers they find. That's called a neighborhood. And then they use the whole neighborhood list. That allows them to tolerate, to, to find matches even with a small number of actual mismatches. I'll talk about that next time. What you should think about is why is this so much faster than uh, dynamic programming? Okay? So just take two sequences at a time and think about this process versus doing dynamic programming. And as the basic fact, you should, you should remember, when you want to do a hash, this operation is very, very fast. All right. See you next time.